morning and good afternoon and good evening to all the dear friends. It's indeed my great pleasure and honor to be invited to give this talk. And my assignment, the assignment to me is uh, to talk to you how to achieve successful outcome in microsurgical reconstruction. The free flap now become the gold standard for head and neck reconstruction. And the most of the major medical centers, they have achieved 96 to 97% of success rate. This means the flap survival rate. This is simply because of the uh, technology innovation and then refine our microsurgical skill. Of course, better understanding of anatomy and the physiology of the flap surgery uh, play also very important uh, roles. In a busy center, a better teamwork and organization also play a very important role in uh, maintaining the high success rate. As now everyone get this high success rate, so the focus of interest have a part in set from, from the flop survival, from the new flop, and now become shifting toward optimization of the functional and aesthetic result. And the minimal those unfavorable results to improve the quality of life. So the definition of successful outcome means that we can avoid uh, even the flood survive, we can uh, achieve, uh, you know, the, a desirable outcome. So the definition of uh, a favorable result in the complication, microsurgical reconstruction, is as such. The reconstruction failed to achieve its goal, although the flood is, uh, is survived, which include the acceptable function and the forms. The reconstruction compromised the immediate result. In some of the cases, although FRAP succeeds, but there are fissure infection, and which lead into the delay of subsequent oncology treatment. Of course, at a late stage, some of the initially uh, uh, survived FRAP may uh, have some complication, such as those related to uh, uh, plate uh, exposure, malocclusion, trismus, or even the osteo or retinal necrosis. Some of them are really independent from the flap survival, but some are related to the less ideal design of the flap or insect or other, you know, uh, 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 consideration during the entire surgery. So we have defined that unfavorable result or complication, in spite of free flap, the mainly from three uh, angles. This is the so-called triangle of unfavorable outcome, which include planning, designing, and also execution of the surgery, which include also kinds of tissue that you choose, kind of flap, and the laterality, inset selection of the recipient vessels, as well as donor site management, etc. Therefore, uh, it's very important to pay attention to every aspect. And I'd like to start to raise your attention to how important the preoperative planning, final planning will be. Of course, we have, when we are given a case, we have several discussions um, with the, you know, uh, all the involved members, including the resection team. But even we have done that, Immediate preoperative, we still need to have a final planning because some of the information that you gather in the past may change. So you need to uh, provide more updated information. So preoperative final planning is a main uh, important thing that I like to e emphasize. It's not only for fear the WHO patient safety checking list. It's provide, as I mentioned, the updated relevant patient's information. It's allowed effective communication in multidisciplinary setting. And of course, at this time, you're able to finalize your surgical planning, and then you give individual members of the team their task. So it's very important that no matter how many times you have to you have done uh, the uh, planning with your teams, 
But immediate operative day, you have to, uh, which means that the day of surgery, you need to have this kind of preoperative final planning. This is the way that we do uh, preoperative planning, that we ask resident or uh, our fellow to present using the, in the earlier days, the whiteboard, but at this time, the PowerPoint presentation to uh, present the uh, patient's profile. And they need to include concise and updated patient information. And then they need to describe the precise surgical plan, including resection and the reconstruction. And then followed by a quick review of the literature that is related to this particular topic. And after this, then we invite comment, question, or discussion from those people who attend this preoperative planning. Here, as you can see, that while the nurse and the anesthetist are preparing the a patient for us, we gather in the corner of operative rooms and we present this kind of preoperative final planning. And then after that, then we confirm our surgical planning with the consensus from the team members. And of course, at this time, the operator who is responsible for surgery should assign an uh, individual person for individual you know, work, such as someone who is responsible for frog harvest, some is responsible for preparation of the recipient site, and then, of course, at this time, we also describe how to design our frog in a proper manner. Here I have example. This is the case that we did uh, four years ago, and it's a primary uh, head and neck reconstruction. And uh, we uh, give the privilege to those uh, members to use those information, you know, whenever they need this. Even when they finish their training and they leave the hospital, they still allow to use uh, this account. The reason they start to prepare, and he will prepare the chip complaint and then present illness, uh, past the history, past the surgical history, and of course, social history as well. And then he will present the image study. And here is a case of aminoblastone over the synthesis and a uh, left uh, parasynthesis. And then additional workup, including, including uh, the examination of the recipient site, like in, in this case, we're going to use the depth of fibula. So we want to know the anterior tibia, posterior tibia, and how the position is. We do not routinely use angiogram. And then here, also the image. And we make the final diagnosis. This is the low-gum aminoblastoma uh, involved the anterior uh, segment. And the resection uh, plan, this will be guided by Yamin Chan, who is an oral surgeon. And they're going to do wide excision. And this is the extent of segmental mandibulectomy. So we estimate the length will be six to seven centimeter. And the flow of the mouth is important. And, and so here we say the limited excision. This means we do not need additional soft tissue coverage. And then we, at that time, we use prevent uh, print uh, based on 3D printing model. And then we want plan to do osteointegration test at the same time if the surgery uh, goes smoothly. But if something happened, then we'd like to focus to ensure that the transplant fibula is survived and implantation. And here is the 3D uh, printing model. And then the surgical planning, you know, the construction of uh, this compound composite mandibulectomy. It's a C type center. And the, for the prop, we uh, first choice is left of fibula osteosarcopital prop with a small skin panel. And when this uh, fail, or because of unexpected difficulty, then we like to do alternative uh, bony tissue, which uh, mainly the iliac. 
And we wanted to double bed off whenever possible because this involved the central uh, mandible. We want to make sure that the height is restored. And then, if it's possible, we like to uh, re repair the nerve with a vein graft, with a nerve graft. And because when you do, when you do the segmental mandibulectomy, you inevitably will reset the uh, inferior alveolar nerve. So whenever possible, we like to restore its continuity with a, a nerve graft from the same donor side of the fibula. And because this is the primary surgery, so there's no restriction of recipient uh, vessel use. And however, we have uh, uh, the choice between the left lingual artery or superior thyroid artery. And then after this, then the resident and the fellow will present their reading of most relevant uh, literature. And here they are interested in during the day. Actually, this is the first case that we perform the during the day. So they, they review the during the day, the literature, and start from the introduction and the summary, and then uh, start to talk about the during the day, the strengths and the weakness that mentioned in the literature. And then after that, he will uh, need to point out what is the implication of during the day to our practice. And for the time's sake, I'm not going to uh, go this detail. And then after this, we have thorough discussion and we need to finalize the surgical plan. Of course, that is the responsibility of the main, uh, of the main uh, operator. And in this case, we decide that we want to use left fibula osteoceptocutaneous flap with a small skin island to allow primary closure of the donor side as well as, as, well as for uh, post-operative monitoring. We want to do one osteotomy and then that means to start to fit the contour. We try to have double bell off in the central part of the mandible. And of course, when we encounter difficulty, then we will uh, compromise a little bit. And we want to do nerve graft to bilateral inferior of your nerve. And the operator at the time, we decide that I like to be responsible for the flap harvest and the osteotomy and inserting. And I have my uh, fellow, Anton, uh, at that day uh, to follow me. And Iki is uh, one of the uh, senior residents. They also uh, follow me for uh, the surgery and scrub with me. And then at this time, we still have a, you know, a extra manpower and uh, who is our super fellow, Nitao. So he is responsible for videotaping of some of the surgical procedure that we want to share with people later on. And this is the picture that taken during the surgery. You see it's a segment and this is the defect. And this is the way that we use uh, for uh, contouring of the bone osteotomy. Of course, at this time, we changed already. This, is, this was four to four and a half years ago. And now we change to this uh, cutting guide, fibula cutting guide using the KCAM uh, model. And here are some other pictures of the uh, insert of the flap and also uh, nerve graft to bilateral lingual nerve. You, you can see this is not uh, perfect, but it's good enough uh, to allow an event of uh, you know, uh, uh, bone union. And immediately after surgery is like this. And of course, in this patient, we have osteointegration teeth, and we also uh, have connected to the, to the, uh, to the uh, I mean, the processes. And we uh, have complete our uh, joint day in this uh, case. And I like to emphasize the intraoperative picture is very important. So, like this. Later on, when you need to reflect or you need to figure out something to uh, improve your technique, it's very useful. And this is the patient database in routine in every single case. Like in this patient, the operative day, the diagnosis, the excision, and the reconstruction, the flap, 
and its category. And if there are any specific note you want to make, like in this patient, I will have it done like this. It uses the lithographic model, a stubble bellow. It has, you know, bilateral nerve graft to the inferior alveolar nerve. So later on, when we want to uh, give a talk or we want to publish something, this is a very useful information. And here, this is almost for every single patient. You see the patient, preoperative, preoperative, preoperative picture, preoperative picture here, and intraoperative, 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 and then followed by the postoperative follow up. As this patient uh, is uh, working in the United States, he, she was not able to come back for further up, for further follow up in the past almost two years. But I believe when the COVID-19 uh, and 19 become not a problem, then uh, she will return here for another uh, follow-up. And another patient, like here you see another patient, this uh, have uh, left the uh, buccal squamous cell carcinoma. And in this case, we also perform segmental mandibulectomy and we use double uh, flap to reconstruct the effect. So here, and then we are able to trace them if we key in the category. And this is to every single case. Here, I want to emphasize that a complete recording, even slide, all the intraoperative information, postoperative course, is very critical you know, for the academic um, uh, practice. Here you see we have the pre-op, and this is uh, the uh, fire or the preoperative uh, planning. In case we need to review them, can see this. And you see the intraoperative defect, and then postoperative, and then postoperative follow up. Something, uh, every single case like this. And following this, I'd like to talk about some potential uh, unfavorable result, although the flap uh, is survived in the initial reconstruction. And particularly, I want to talk, remind you about the reconstruction of the tongue. Because when we say hemigrosectomy, when we say partial grossectomy, if you don't understand, if you don't uh, understand the main anatomy, and if you don't make an adequate uh, recording, it's difficult to compare different, uh, I mean, uh, patients and their result so that we can improve. Here, it's very important that we have to pay attention that the transition of, the, when we reconstruct the tongue, transition of uh, between the floor of the mouth and tongue is very important. Here, you have to have some transition. And it's very important, even more important, is to suspend those critical structure, which include this, you know, uh, the uh, grosso, grosso, uh, is, you know, the style of grosso uh, muscle. And also flow of the mouth is very important. So this need to be obliterated, this area. So those uh, blue line are the two area that you need to suspend. And in between are the dead space that you need to obliterate. And it require a thicker and, a, and proxima a skin pedal to achieve this goal. And it can be also achieved obliteration by the absorption of skin flap or even include a small piece of muscle. I think those keep in mind that you know uh, how to improve the uh, functional result of the tongue reconstruction of various size. And here I have a list and favorable result following the hemigrosectomy and the flow of the mouse which includes those, including inadequate volume, tethering, and slurring speech, and deep cold swelling, fissure, and tongue appearance of this. I think those unfavorable results can be avoided by paying those attention individually, uh, which because of time limitation, I do not want to uh, individually mention them. And then in case this happened, a favorable complication happen. How we manage that? Then here are the answers, including the second free flap Z plus D or some other uh, 
uh, approach. So it's ideally we can avoid those unfavorable results and they get the successful outcome and with those measures taken to avoid them. And in case it's happened, then we need to give this suggestion to individual situation. And with this, for example, like here is a patient with hemigrosectomy, it's evolved for the mouse, and therefore we need to reconstruct the flow of the mouse. So here you can see, because of this attention, we're able to get a quite successful outcome. The patient has quite acceptable speech and there's no uh, eating uh, problems. When the defect of the tongue become uh, bigger, it's become nearly total or total prostatum. Again, we also identify several uh, potential and favorable results. So in order to achieve a successful outcome, we have to avoid those. And the, those are the things that we least important to avoid them. In case it happened, then we need to use those suggested methods, suggested methods uh, to overcome, to further improve its function. Here I give you an example. For example, like this patient, it's a nearly total, actually it's a total prostatum. And this defect was reconstructed with a anterior side flap with a functioning bustus lateralis. Of course, we want to give the sen sensation to the skin pedal because there's no source for neurotization. So we need to repair the motor nerve and with the hypogrossal, and then we need to repair the sensory nerve to the lingual nerve. And of course, the hyoid bone it's very important, you need to, sus to suspend that. With this, then you're able to get good result. Here is a case that showing the, the you know, speech, even up the total growth sector. It's intelligible, and even a total growth sector. So we have to pay attention to all those aspects, including suspension of the hyoid bone, and um, uh, give adequate su uh, suspension in the floor of the mouse and the between the geno the genial stenoid, those uh, need to have suspension. And then ideally we're able to uh, motorize the transplanted muscle, which can avoid the atrophy of the muscle. Although it may not be able to move that much, but at least can prevent from, from uh, atrophic change. And then I like to uh, come to another uh, subside. When we have segmented uh, mandibular defect, it's usually associated with some uh, soft tissue, either intraoral or outside the so called compound or composite. So when we reconstruct those kind of defect, you have to take care of both the bone and also the coverage of soft tissue uh, defect. Otherwise, you won't have it successful outcome. So the unfavorable result after a fibular reconstruction or other bone reconstruction of segmental mandibular defect, you have mild occlusion, you have plate with soft tissue flap reconstruction, uh, only those kind of plate related complication. And sometimes if the uh, soft tissue too buck, it may compromise the airway. And, but on the contrary, if the soft tissue is inadequate, it may have the sunken appearance. And we should avoid them with those that I have mentioned here. In case it's already happened, then those are the measures that allow us to overcome and to correct them. For example, like this patient who presents with a composite mandibular defect, mandible, intraoral lining, an external official defect, and here you can see the defect. So even we use a fibula osteocutaneous flap with inclusion of the solus muscle, we try to provide adequate volume replacement, but you still see that after radiotherapy, there's a sunken appearance, sunken appearance. So when the soft tissue deficit is extensive, sometimes, in a good 
prognosis a case and in the selected case, you have to consider a double flap. Like in this patient, same kind of defect, then we use a free bit of osteoceptopitone flap for intraoral lining and the mandible reconstruction. And then we use second flap, which is a anterior side with inclusion of the vastus lateralis and is designed as a chimeric flap for the outside skin coverage and also for the volume replacement. So with this, even after radiotherapy, you can see quite acceptable uh, appearance and the function. And then sometimes when we perform the segmentum and the bilectomy and have the high osteotomy, and it's very difficult to maintain the remaining condyle and the coronary process. And as a result of that, if there are some displacement, it may cause pain, trismus, or my occlusion. And, and this is the way how to avoid it. It's very important to have a pre-printing of the condyle. Or sometimes you may feel that coronary uh, should be removed. And, and then when it's already happened, then you have to consider how to uh, have a plate uh, release, that kind of uh, management. And with this kind of uh, precaution, this patient, as an example, high osteotome is performed on here, very close to the condyle uh, process. So in this patient, before we make segmental osteotomy, we fix the remnant part of the condyle to the maxilla, so-called rural procedures. And this allow us to avoid subsequent dislocation of the coronary process and condyle process. And with this kind of precaution, you can see we still have very, very good, you know, uh, functional result. And the patient do not have the uh, joint problem that related to dislocation of the coronary process or uh, uh, conduct a uh, process. Many patients, uh, because of the adjacent uh, location, the buccal cancer involves the upper margin of the mandible. Therefore, many patients require marginal mandibulectomy. And when you have significant amount of the upper of the upper part of the mandible removed, then if you do not take caution, it may become fracture later on, or may become osteoradionecrosis because of the extensive you know, blood, blood supply loss. And then we should be careful to provide some protective you know, plate. Or may, you know, of course, during the surgery, we should avoid a nasal stripping or midline uh, manipulator. And we can also use part of our skin flap to provide additional uh, coverage of this uh, 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 plate. So by doing this, we can avoid the complication that resulted from extensive marginal mandibulectomy operation. So about the intraoral lining, after extensive intraoral lining resection, the patient may concern about the dry mouth. And if this become a major concern, you may consider using intestinal uh, structure to reserve the intraoral lining so that it can come, continue to, to have secretion, mucus secretions. And if uh, the skin flap not able to achieve that goal. And of course, the treatment should be avoided. This should be, uh, this consideration should include excision of all the tethering you know, scar tissue, and then post-operative adequate rehabilitation. Like in this patient, uh, the patient is so concerned about the dry mouth appearance because uh, his brother had the same kind of problem and received the surgery of the mucosa, which was reconstructed with a skin flap. So we decided to use a colon flap. And then with this colon, after a couple of years follow up, it still remained functioning. You can see the uh, weight appearance that comes from 
the mucin secretion from the chronic drug. Here you can see a good result of such kind of approach. And the um, uh, sunken appearance when the uh, Baja Mikosa were extensively in the Tribong area or in the Zong Tu area. And because that may also involve the excision of Baja fat and very extensive uh, soft tissue here. So in this situation, you had to provide a bigger a skin flap, and sometimes the skin flap uh, can, some part of the skin flap can be epithelized and used to augment the volume so that even after reconstruction and the radiation, the patient still have adequate, uh, you know, uh, the soft tissue uh, volume. So the sunken appearance become less, but still some, still some. So if you pay more attention and uh, uh, give more volume, then this can be avoided. Like in this case, we provide adequate volume, then there's no sunken appearance at all, even after radiotherapy. So the volume is important. You're never able to predict how much sunken, how much shrinkage of the skin flap will have after radiotherapy. So ideally, you're able to provide, you know, uh, large enough. And then in case it's too bulky after radiotherapy, then you can uh, trim in them instead of have the sunken appearance, which you have more difficulty to overcome. And sometimes because of limited volumes, that doesn't allow you to have a watertight closure of the uh, floor of the mask, then it's become a problem. So for oral cutaneous fissure, this is the case. Initially, we reconstruct with a forearm flap, but because of the limited soft tissue in the floor of the mouse, it ends up that here you have some uh, oral cutaneous fissure. So to overcome this, we need to do another surgery. We have to trace the uh, fissure tract, and we have to use another small skin flap to cover to cover this and to see of the defect and then with this additional surgery we finally solve the problem for this patient and here another case you know in contrast to the earlier one we use anterior side flap the anterior side flap provide enough value that even you do not have a watertight closure the a saliva intraorally won't be able to leak into the deep tissue and then come to the neck. So with this, then we're able to uh, have even ensure uh, better closure of the dome or the floor of the mouse and then prevent the uh, oral cutaneous uh, fissure. And this is the case to show the successful outcome, uh, even with extensive floor of the mouse defect. I like to. Uh, conclude that how to avoid uh, how to avoid a success uh, a favorable result and and achieve successful outcome in microsurgical reconstruction basically depend on the mindset of and the skill of the uh, reconstructive microsurgeon I would encourage all the microsurgeon should aim high to achieve success to achieve reconstruction and result, not only uh, happy with the disease-free survival and successful flap transfer, we also need to aim to achieve optimum or at least acceptable quality of life, which include the form, function, and the minimum uh, donor sign mobility. I think if you aim high and you ask yourself to do more to the patient, you have a better chance to achieve successful outcome. And of course, those to aim high and to get result depend very much on adequate knowledge, adequate surgical skill, and a very good preoperative planning. And I'd like to uh, share a couple of things that may help to achieve this goal. One is that you have to bulletproof micro. Microsurgical skill. 
almost all the failure happen. Then you have to reflect yourself. Is that the technique involved or is other factors? But most of the time, you have to uh, start reflection from how your microsurgical skill. So it's very important that you have to train yourself to be almost 100% you know, confidence in the microanastomosis, so-called bulletproof. And you have to master it, to master some of the old host. This is something that I want to emphasize. Instead of able to do so many uh, flaps and everything make you, every flap make you nervous, you better must several old host flap, including you know, one or two bone flap, one or two uh, soft tissue flap, and then maybe if you are doing the extremity reconstruction, you have to learn how to do, uh, I mean, uh, total hand transfer and that kind of things. And it's very important, even you have uh, adequate knowledge, surgical skill, you still may have some brand a point, you know, uh, when you uh, plan a surgery by a single mite, a surgeon. So repeated preoperative planning it's very important. This allow you a thorough you know, discussion between every uh, members of the team to avoid single surgeon mind decision. And you have to set a well-defined goals. You know, sometimes when uh, the, the construction is too complicated, you're not able to achieve all the goal you want to achieve, but you have to at this uh, time, you have to set a particular uh, goal that you feel the most important. And then you have to have the subsequent you know, procedure also this, so that when you achieve one goal, then you can proceed to do another goal. You always have to do um, whatever the procedure. You have to always, in a very organized way, you have to, to do the surgery in a stepwise approach everything okay so that you don't miss any particular important you know, point that because of uh, not following the SOP. And of course, I like to emphasize, after you aim high and you have to frequently reflect, reflect or introspect what you have done uh, good or what you have done wrong so that the next time when the similar case come, you don't repeat the same mistake, or you can even improve further, even you already have a good result, but you can, you know, uh, uh, I mean, even improve that. So through this, I'd like to conclude my presentation of how to avoid successful outcome in microsurgical reconstruction. Once again, I'd like to thank uh, Eric, and also Charles for um, prepare this uh, PowerPoint presentation and for the Raisin uh, series. And thank you very much.